Hi. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is finish up the vision lecture right now. So the last time uh, that we met in class, we were talking about subcortical pathways. And we talked about the geniculus striate pathway versus the tectopulvinar pathway and how the geniculus striate pathway goes to the striate cortex and is responsible for our conscious visual awareness. And so if that one's broken, but your tectopulvinar pathway is still intact, you are not consciously aware of visual processing, but you can still have visual processing that you're unconsciously aware of. So that was kind of wild, and we went over the phenomenon of blind sight. So I just want to make the point that that's about damage to subcortical structures. The geniculus striate pathway is a subcortical structure going to the cortex, going to the striate cortex, uh, which is the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is about what happens once we get to the cortex. All right, so blind sight is a phenomenon that has to do with subcortical damage and information not getting to the striate cortex. Now I'm going to talk about what happens when the information does get to the striate cortex, and then it has to be shared with the rest of the brain for further processing. So I'm going to be talking about the cortex now. Now uh, we're assuming we're up here in the cortex. We made it, the information made it to the occipital lobe. What happens next? So um, here are some pictures showing you uh, various highlights of the occipital lobe and the primary visual cortex. Uh, the primary visual cortex goes by a number of different names. It goes by V1, which stands for vision one. Um, primary visual cortex means it's the part of the cortex where the first vision processing takes place. Um, sometimes you'll just see PVC. Uh, it's not a PVC pipe, it's the primary visual cortex in this uh, context. And like I say, the striate cortex, because it appears to be striped when you look at it. Um, uh, you see it in all of these different pictures here. Uh, it has six layers. The fourth layer is where the main input goes for um, <clears throat> Uh, visual processing, conscious visual awareness. Uh, that's where, you know, after it goes to the LGN on the thalamus, it goes to the striate cortex. That's that main input layer, V4. Um, so what happens next? After the information goes to the occipital lobe, it's going to be shared with the rest of the brain. So the information kind of went from the eyes back through the thalamus and to the back of the head. And now we're going to send it back forward up to the cortex so that more processing can occur. All right. So to review, when we talked about the geniculus striate pathway and the tectopulvinar pathway, those subcortical pathways, that's going from your retina to the tectopulvinar pathway goes superior colliculus, pulvinar, which is on the thalamus, and then goes to the rest of the brain, never goes to the occipital lobe. But the main pathway, the main visual pathway goes to your LGN on your thalamus and then to the primary visual cortex, to your occipital lobe. What happens after that? Okay, so the sub, there will be a question on the exam about sub, this subcortical processing. Do not get it mixed up with another question on the exam, which is what I'm about to talk about, which is cortical processing. All right? So this is cortical processing. There are two pathways, two main pathways, that the cortical processing takes after the information gets to the occipital lobe. One goes up and over, so it comes from the back, from your occipital lobe, up and over to the top of your head, where your parietal lobe is. Now your parietal lobe, hopefully you remember somewhere in there, that your parietal lobe is mainly involved in processing somatosensory information. Information that comes from your body about the environment where things are in the environment, how you interact with the environment. Those are the kinds of processing that your uh, parietal lobe is doing. It's making you aware of where your body is in space, somatosensory information. And so if you're integrating visual information with somatosensory information, 
That's the pa first pathway I'm talking about. That's called a, the dorsal pathway. The dorsal pathway goes from the occipital lobe up and over to the top of the head to the parietal lobe. That pathway is responsible for integrating visual and tactile information and therefore that's the pathway that lets you know how to do things. How do I use visual information to interact with the world? How can I pick up a phone? How can I pick up a marker? How can I sit in this chair? All of the different things you have to know how to do, it's the dorsal stream that's responsible for that. But you don't, when you see an object, you, your body, your brain processes, your body takes in the information and processes to your brain how you can interact with that object. You see a chair, your, your brain knows how you should use that visual information to sit down in that chair. That's the dorsal pathway. But knowing how to use a chair isn't the only thing that you might want to know about a chair. You also might want to know what it is. What is that object? Is it a chair? Is it a desk? Is it a set of stairs? You know, you might want to have a certain label on it to know what the object is. That what processing, what is this object? Is it a chair? Is it a table? Is it a marker? Is it a phone? Is it my best friend? The what processing takes place along the ventral pathway. And that should make sense too because the ventral pathway goes from your occipital lobe down and to the sides to your temporal lobes. Your temporal lobes are on the side of your head. And what are your temporal lobes involved in processing? Well, auditory information and human auditory information tends to be language information. So our temporal lobes are heavily involved in processing language information. And so it makes sense that if you're integrating visual and language information, that that pathway can tell you what something is. The word for it. Is it a chair? Is it a table? Etc. Okay, so that those are the two main streams uh, for being able to understand how and what, how, uh, how to interact with an object and what that object is, which are the main things we need to do to, you know, exist as human beings. Okay, so now we're going to watch a video about a man who has damage to one of the pathways, um, to one of these pathways. He has damage to a part of his ventral stream. And the part of his ventral stream uh, that he has damage to is very specific and only for certain objects. So he knows the name for some objects, but then other objects he, he'll struggle with knowing what, what they are, literally what they are because of this damage. So we're going to watch that video, and then at the end of the video I'm going to come back and just say one more thing. Okay, here we go. eyes at the very earliest stages of seeing. When I was a medical student, I was taught as an area of the back of the brain with visual cortex. And that's where it just with seeing. And maybe these different areas are specialized for different aspects of vision. One area for seeing colors, another area for seeing movement, form and shape, relative distance and depth. Now, despite this staggering complexity of all these different areas, there seems to be a simple overall pattern of organization. In fact, the visual input as it comes in seems to divide into two parallel streams of processing. There is one pathway which we call the how pathway to which some of these areas belong. And that how pathway seems to be concerned mainly with navigation, with being able to walk around, avoid bumping into obstacles, be avoiding uneven terrain, 
reaching out and grabbing something. The how pathway leads from the main visual areas to the top of the brain. The other pathway is the what pathway, and this leads from the main visual areas to the temporal lobes. The what pathway is concerned with recognizing the object. What am I looking at? What does it mean for me? Is this an edible object? Is it a flower? Is it a person's face? What is it that I'm looking at, and what does it mean for me? That's what the what pathway is concerned with, and it's that pathway that seems to be damaged in film. One of the first things we learn to do is to recognize and name animals. They're camels. I'll hazard against the camels. <laughs> Too late, you're off. But if it hadn't seen the cycles, then I wouldn't have known. Last summer, Ramachandran was invited to meet Philip in Cambridge to witness a series of tests. He had a hunch that Philip's naming problem was a key to understanding the brain's recognition system. What's that camel? I'm introducing you to Philip, who I've been working with for several years now. Um, Back in the, in the late 70s, he was involved in a very serious car accident and this left him comatose for a number of weeks. And when he actually came round from the coma, it was noted that he'd got problems in recognising people's faces and also in recognising animals and fruit and vegetables. History starts for me after the date of the accident because as a result of the accident, my memory is very, very short. Now, when you look at an animal, what is your feeling about it? I mean, is it, does it look fuzzy? Does it look out of focus? Or you know what it is, but you can't say it out loud because it's at the tip of your tongue? If I know what it is, but I can't, it's not the tip of my tongue, you say, but I just can't place it. Although Philip's shattered memory is a severe problem for him, he does manage to lead a relatively normal life. Skin. Now, this difficulty, it seems to be relatively isolated difficulty in that he can actually recognise the buildings, he doesn't get lost, he drives his way around Cambridge, collects his daughter from school every day. In the first test, Philip is shown pictures of famous buildings, which he seems to take in his stride. That's Cambridge. That's King's College Chapel. He's done it for the box and that's all. <laughs> to anybody else, I'm just perfectly normal because I'm that good at masking over when I'm trying to bluff my way around a situation. I can take you from A to B, no trouble. What's clear is that he's not blind. Absolutely. Um, and this suggests that the notion that vision is one process is clearly wrong. There are all these subtle processes going on in the 30 or odd visual areas that have been described in the primate brain. And some of these pathways can be selectively damaged. So you get these very, very fascinating deficits where one category alone is affected with other categories being intact. What's this thing? Electric block. Pair glasses. Philip is fine with objects. It's with categories of living things that the problems start. So can you tell me about this one? I know what it is, but I can't name it. Uh -huh. And it's annoying me. Philip's phrase is a bit odd. He says he knows what it is, but he can't name it. But in fact, in most instances, he doesn't even know what it is. This brings us face to face with the mysterious borderland between seeing and knowing, which has always puzzled philosophers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you don't know it's a rhino, how can you tell us it's a rhino? If the teacher's told you. Well, if you don't know what a rhino is, how do you know what a rhino is? If you don't know what a rhino is, how do you know what a rhino is? I couldn't have put it better myself. You have just said it all. You have just said it all. Okay, 
So Philip had damage to part of his what pathway and he didn't, he wasn't able to say what certain objects are. He wasn't able to know what certain objects are due to that damage. Um, but he was able to identify other objects because of the parts that were okay in his ventral stream. And of course he could interact with objects because his dorsal stream was totally fine. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is receptive fields. And we've kind of talked about this in a way before when we were talking about the parvocellular pathway versus the magnocellular pathway, the P pathway and the M pathway um, that comes from your retina. Uh, the P pathway being the one that comes from the fovea and it will just be one or a few cones talking to eventually one ganglion cell. Whereas in the magnocellular path pathway, you have many uh, photoreceptors that are um, picking up information that's being summed up and sent to one ganglion cell. That, those receptors are called a receptive field. The, all of the receptors that are connected to one ganglion cell are that ganglion cell's receptive field. So you can have a large receptive field where a lot of photoreceptors are talking to fewer intermediate cells, which is just talking to one ganglion cell, large receptive field talking to one ganglion cell, or you can have a small receptive field like one cone talking to one intermediate cell talking to one ganglion cell. That's a very small receptive field. And as we mentioned before, the larger the receptive field is, the less detailed the information will be that's sent to the brain. Because the larger the receptive field is, the more you have to sum up information across a larger area. So larger receptive field, less detailed information. Smaller receptive field, much more detailed information. Okay, so um, that's where we're gonna stop with uh, the vision lecture and so I'm going to end this video here and then I'm going to come back in just a second and talk about uh, audition. Thanks.